This episode of Timeless Leadership is sponsored in part by Gemography. Get access to top remote developers at gemography.com slash hire. That's G-E-M-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y dot com slash hire. I can't remember which president said this, but one of them said there are no easy decisions on the president's desk, that by the time it has gotten to the president, it is a really difficult decision. And lives are often at stake. It often has implications for the global economy or the global community. And so when you're talking about the sheer complexity and number of difficult issues facing the president, you want there to be a lot of different ideas and eyeballs on those issues. Otherwise, you're going to succumb to things like groupthink or bad decision making. And it's pretty clear from, you know, CEOs and boards all the way down to nonprofits, that if you can pull together a diverse group of people, they're going to make better decisions. The same is true for the presidency and the cabinet just on a much bigger and I would argue more impactful scale. Decision making is hard for any leader, and particularly the president. That's why it's all the more remarkable when we consider our very first president, George Washington, determined that he, even as a military leader, didn't have the sole decision-making capabilities to be successful as a president. And this is the story of how he developed the cabinet. This is Timeless Leadership, where we explore what makes extraordinary people tick. We look for the universal truths that will help make us better versions of ourselves. Welcome to Timeless Leadership. I'm your host, Scott Monty. It's a pleasure to have you with me here today. It's going to be a great conversation with Dr. Lindsay Trevinsky, author of The Cabinet. George Washington and the creation of an American institution. We take board meetings and executive meetings for granted now, but it wasn't always the case. And George Washington, in doing many things in his life, and certainly in his presidency, was a first. I'd just like to remind you that next week, in the very next episode, it will be a commentary show with Q&A. So please send me an email at timelesspod at scottmonte.com with any questions you have, anything that's on your mind, anything you'd like to answer, perhaps get out there for additional discussion. I'd like to help you as much as I can in your evolution as a leader. So again, email me at timelesspod at scottmonte.com. I'd also like to point out that we have sponsors for this show. I hope you will give them a listen and give them a click. It would help me and it would certainly help them as well. And if you're interested in sponsoring Timeless Leadership, just check out the link in the show notes. Dr. Lindsay M. Chervinsky is a historian of the presidency, political culture, and the government, especially the president's cabinet. She's a senior fellow at the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University and produces history that speaks to fellow scholars as well as a larger public audience. Dr. Chervinsky believes history can be exhilarating, and she works to share her passion with as many people as possible. Her research can be found in publications from op-eds to books, speaking on podcasts and other media, and teaching for every kind of audience. Dr. Chervinsky's book, The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution, was published in April of 2020 with a paperback in 2022. She also co-edited Mourning the President's Loss and Legacy in American Culture from 2023. She's a regular guest on podcasts and appears frequently on the Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast. She's the creator of the Audible course, The Best and Worst Presidential Cabinets in History, and author of the newsletter, Imperfect Union. 
Dr. Lindsay M. Travinsky, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Well, and just for uh, the sake of my own verbal tics and our listeners, I'm just going to call you Lindsay, if that's okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, why is George Washington's cabinet important and relevant to us in the 21st century? Starting with a small question, huh? Sure. You know, um, I, I figured we'd just kind of <laughs> ease into it, you know? Yeah, ease into it. Uh, no, I love it. It's a great place to begin. Uh, George Washington's cabinet is incredibly important for the 21st century for a couple of reasons. If anyone has a copy of the Constitution or if you have Google in front of you, I highly recommend looking at Article 2. It is incredibly short and there's very little there, which meant that when Washington came into office in April of 1789, he was essentially designing an institution from scratch and really having to flesh out all of the fuzzy bits that aren't written down. And that required an enormous amount of precedent-setting decisions every single day, including how he would sort of govern on a daily basis. And the cabinet, which he created – wasn't something he turned to until a couple of years into his administration, really out of necessity, but it has shaped and designed the executive branch ever since because it is very much a personal creation of Washington's and it is a personal creation of every president. So each president gets to really decide how those interactions and those relationships are going to take place. And anytime we have a historic anything, whether it's legislation, war, social movement, reform, you name it, the cabinet is almost always involved. So we cannot separate the cabinet from the presidency or really even American history. Yeah. And, you know, that is fascinating because when we think about, uh, you know, the executive branch, the cabinet, the president, etc., it seems to most modern Americans who don't study history that closely, which is most modern Americans, unfortunately, um, that it's always been there. And we, we just assume that that's the way it was set up. And yet, um, as you say, Washington was forging this himself for the very first time. And the thing that strikes me about Washington as a leader is he takes great care and great pains in a lot of these decisions because he is aware that he is setting a precedent. Can you maybe talk a little bit about his... Uh, the psyche and, you know, perhaps what he was considering at the time. Absolutely. And you're right that we really do a disservice to his leadership if we view it from the perspective of 2023, when we know what happened, we know how it worked out, we know how the cabinet has continued to evolve, but they did not have that same sort of knowledge. And so, in 1789, when he came into office and then when he convened his first cabinet meeting on November 26th, 1791, he was acutely aware of how frequently governments had failed in the past, especially republics. They tended to devolve into anarchy or into a dictatorship. And the most recent example was the French Revolution, which was sort of just beginning and would become only increasingly violent as the years went on. And so he was so concerned that any one misstep would cause the presidency to fail and cause the nation to fail. And that sounds kind of hyperbolic to us, again, because we have this perspective of knowing what happens. But the Confederation had just essentially failed. And so he knew the nation was on its second chance. And that doesn't happen very often. And so, so many of his peers, Washington especially, were just so nervous about making the correct choice. And so anytime he made a decision, he knew that it would likely govern for good or for ill, the people that came after him. And that pressure was just constant, mm. such that when he was going to his inauguration, he wrote to a friend that he felt like he was a prisoner going to the place of execution, which is not exactly <laughs> like the super positive inauguration <laughs> sentiment we often think of. That's amazing. Um, and and the thing is, with, with respect to Washington – 
he didn't have the same kind of classical education that the other founding fathers had. And, and I think it's well documented that uh, there, there was a bit of insecurity that he had uh, regarding his own education. And because of that, he was self-taught. You know, he went out and he sought out more information. But I think in the back of his mind, he's, he's still a little self-doubting, a little insecure. And yet, what does he do? He, he you know, as you say, is really uh, cognizant about the precedent that's being set. But at the same time, he also very carefully picks the people that are going to make up his cabinet, or before there was a cabinet, the people that would make up the secretaries of uh, the various uh, agencies. I'm, I'm interested in, maybe you could outline who some of those people are and why they were important to Washington and the eventual makeup of the cabinet. Well, I think that that insecurity is actually what drove him a, to be a, a really good leader, especially later in his life, but also drove the way he made decisions. Because, as you said, he was keenly aware of what he didn't know. He was keenly aware of the skills he did not have and his relatively limited personal experience. The war stuff he kind of had down. You know, he didn't need a whole lot of assistance there. But when it came to diplomacy or financial affairs, he had never been to any of the great courts of diplomacy in Europe, and he didn't speak French, which was the language of diplomacy at the time. So as he was setting out on this process, he really thought about what skills and experience he needed to supplement his own, and of course, wanted people that he could trust and he knew. So that's sort of, you know, an obvious prerequisite if you're surrounding yourself with people that you're going to ask for advice. It's helpful if you trust that advice. But then he had two other factors in mind. And the first was this experience and this knowledge. Was it different than his own? Did it supplement his own? Did it help him in some way make better decisions? And then the second factor was, did it contribute to a sense of national unity? And when we look at the cabinet today, we think that's five dead white guys. It's not particularly diverse, <laughs> but contemporaries actually saw it as this remarkably diverse body because only white guys were allowed to be citizens. But there were people that had different backgrounds, different educations, represented different regions, different economic experiences and factions. And so any different type of American, which really meant any different type of white male, was represented in the cabinet. And so here's how that sort of played out in terms of the people. Thomas Jefferson represented the elite slave-owning plantation owner from Virginia. He had also had a great deal of international experience, had traveled extensively, was fluent in French, and so he would help Washington with those matters of state. Alexander Hamilton originally was born in the Caribbean, but had made his home in New York City, was very close with the merchant and banking elite in the Northeast, and was financially a brilliant mind. And so he could certainly explain these things to Washington, but Hamilton was able to be creative in a way that Washington didn't necessarily have. Similarly, Henry Knox, while he and George Washington shared a lot of military background, he had been the acting Secretary of War during the Confederation period and had overseen all of the treaties with Native American nations and attempts to reform the militia. And so that sort of institutional knowledge was really, really valuable. And Washington was quite intentional about making sure there was representation of all of those different things in the cabinet and continued to be represented in the cabinet cabinet, even as those first selections retired or resigned. It's interesting because it's a very modern style of leadership, at least the way we think about it. Um, it, it for so many years, I think leadership was command and control, was more military in nature than uh, collaborative. And yet here, Washington, a military man, is very interested in taking into account the skills and the background of the people that were around him. And um, I, I just I want to pause a moment because I think it's important for modern listeners to understand that for Americans of that early period, to be someone from Virginia was very, very different than to be someone from Massachusetts or Maine. Um, 
the, the, the colonies, as they had evolved, had very, very distinct regionalities and personalities about them. And there was a lot of discord, you know, certainly coming out of the Continental Congress and then certainly going into uh, the cabinet as well. So how, how did Washington deal with discord on his cabinet? Yeah, it's, it's a really great point. And in fact, there's an anecdote about the Continental Congress, the first time it met in 1774, that I think is really illustrative of that point, which is that the delegates that had that came to Philadelphia for that Continental Congress, more of them had been to London than had been to Philadelphia when they oh first God. arrived. <laughs> wow. Which I think just goes to show that they had these incredible connections to, quote unquote, the homeland, but not necessarily to each other. And the cultural differences were real and intense. And so when they came into the cabinet, it wasn't just that they disagreed on financial policy or they disagreed on diplomacy. They really disagreed on what it meant to be a virtuous Republican, and this is little r Republican, or what it meant to be a good American, what the future of the country should be, how the country should approach its growth. And so it really shaped their entire worldview. And those differences were apparent from the very beginning. I mean, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, for fans of the musical will know, they came to really loathe one another. But from the very beginning, there there was respect, but there was always disagreement. And so Washington had to be fairly meticulous about how he consulted with them, how he sought out their opinions, how he cultivated good relationships. And here he really borrowed from the experiences that he had perfected during the Continental Army. Whenever he would convene a council of war, he would do a couple of things. First, he would come up with a list of questions, try and keep everyone on topic, and make sure everyone was prepared before coming to that council. Then he would use that list of questions as the meeting agenda. And if the officers at the time, and then when he adopted this practice into the cabinet, if they disagreed, he would ask for written opinions afterwards. And this was designed to ensure that Washington had all the information at hand. He could study the different positions, make sure he hadn't misunderstood anything, make sure he hadn't missed any options but also to make sure that each person was heard and had the opportunity to fully express themselves. And this was particularly important given that some of the cabinet members, like Hamilton, tended to talk over others. So, you know, (laughs) wanted to make sure that they all had a fair chance. Um, And then afterwards, he really reassured them how important they were and how much they mattered and how much he cared about their opinion and how much he you know, valued their presence and their advice. And this was something that he reassured them of all the time. And so I think that this process, while imperfect, because obviously at some point Jefferson did end up retiring because he couldn't handle it anymore, it made the group last longer than they would have otherwise. Mm. That's that's really an incredibly powerful example of, uh, you know, what we would now call an emotionally intelligent leader, um, encouraging and um, ensuring that everyone has uh, a voice. I mean, uh, again, a very modern sense of leadership out of Washington here and a very early example. And what's what's interesting to me is that uh, he came out of the, the military. He had war councils when he was uh, commanding the, uh, the, the American troops in the Revolutionary War. Um, and it wasn't necessarily kind of prescribed that he would, uh, he would take these practices to the government. I mean, it was a very military style of management. And yet, um, I think before the, the cabinet was formed, you mentioned there were uh, three different kinds of either executive councils or interactions that were recommended for the president, but none of them were taken up. Yes, this is, that's right. And I think that this is essential because it demonstrates how little was written down and how few precedents or models there were to follow. So the, for example, the states at the time, they had councils that quote unquote, assisted the governor. 
But really, these councils were designed to limit executive authority. They were responsible to the legislature. And that was not a model that most people were trying to replicate because they worried about the lack of executive authority and a lack of, the lack of executive energy, as they referred to it. Another option would have been some sort of development of like a prime minister type position. And I could see this have happening in one of two ways. Either the vice president maybe be, would have become like a sort of like a pseudo prime minister or spokesperson for the administration, because at that point, the vice president did sit in the Senate every single day it was in session. Or, for example, Washington was quite close with James Madison in the early years of the administration. And often Madison would sort of arrange to have things come up in a way that was pleasing to Washington. But that relationship soured, and so that option kind of deteriorated as that relationship didn't go anywhere. And so I think that those are really interesting sort of counterfactuals to think about how it might have developed differently. Yeah. And lastly, yeah, and lastly, the third one was, you know, it's not impossible that the Supreme Court could have taken a slightly different role because John Jay was very close with Washington. He was very close with Alexander Hamilton. He often provided them advice and support behind the scenes. And yet, when Washington asked the entire Supreme Court for their opinion in 1793 during the crisis, they said that that wasn't entirely appropriate. And so, had the Supreme Court decided differently, that's another potential option that could have gone a different way and produced a very different type of government. It's amazing to think about the gigantic swings in American culture and history that the Supreme Court uh, has been and is responsible for. We're going to pause here a moment for a quick word from our sponsor. Now, you're here listening to Timeless Leadership or subscribing to the Timeless and Timely newsletter because you believe in improving yourself and learning new things. And maybe you've thought for years about pursuing an MBA or some sort of higher level degree. And the challenge with that is it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, and it's quite expensive. And Augment has come along as an alternative MBA for busy professionals, maybe up and coming younger executives who want to get those actionable business experiences and case studies and knowledge, but without leaving your job or without really breaking the bank. And Augment has hundreds of students who've already used their program, a program that's taught by People like the founders of Wikipedia and Shazam and Waze and YouTube and more to take the next step in developing their careers. Now, this program is entirely online, 100% self-paced. And at the end of it, you actually get a LinkedIn certificate signed by the founder of Shazam. And at the same time, you get access to an exclusive community and LinkedIn group of similarly minded professionals like yourself. So if this sounds like something you'd like to explore, I want you to go to augment.org and get your alternative MBA started. And I'm going to give you 50% off the regular price. All you have to do is use my code, Monty Scholarship, all one word, Monty Scholarship at augment.org for half off the Augment alternative MBA program. And you can also check out their content on Instagram at augment underscore ORG. That's augment underscore ORG on Instagram. Check them out. Poke around and see if you're not as impressed as I am. So impressed that I put them through the very picky process for becoming a sponsor here on the Timeless Leadership Podcast. Augment.org, Monty Scholarship. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. So when it comes to cabinets, 
the, the, the term cabinet was not unfamiliar to uh, Washington and people of his time. They were very familiar with uh, what, what went on uh, across the Atlantic. And I think there was a good degree of skepticism early on about the um, creation of a cabinet with respect to the president. Can you explain why there was so much angst around that? Absolutely. So the British system had a privy council. And as that group became bigger, there was a smaller group that often met in a small chamber with the king, sort of the king's favorites. And that group became known as the king's cabinet council because this room was called the king's cabinet. Cabinet was sort of used as a both in terms of like a storage container and a small room, like a closet, and also a, a group. And so eventually the cabinet council was dropped and it just became known as the cabinet. And Americans were very distrusting of this concept because they blamed the cabinet for instigating the Revolutionary War. Eventually, of course, the king came to take on a great deal of the blame as well. But initially, they believed that this group had turned the king against them. This group had caused the king to let go of his allegiance to the colonies, and they had spurred the legislation that produced the taxes that were so odious to many of the Americans. And so they were very concerned about trying to or the possibility of replicating a cabinet in the American system because it was not always clear who was in it. It was not always clear who had power or authority. It was sensed that it was sort of the the beginnings of corruption and um, cronyism. And that was where a lot of these bad things started in the British system. And so any hint of cabinetness was very suspicious to Americans. And delegates at the Constitutional Convention actually explicitly rejected several proposals for any type of executive council out of fear that it would recreate this corruption and cronyism and lack of transparency in the American system, which is fairly remarkable that just, you know, four years later, Washington ended up recreating, not exactly, but a fairly similar system because he really needed the advice despite what Americans may have feared. And do you think that it was Washington's personality and uh, reputation that made it ultimately more trustworthy? Or was there a process that he went through to ensure that, um, th- that there was more trust involved? I think his name did have a huge impact. The fact that he didn't convene a cabinet right away certainly gave American people some time to get used to the presidency, some time to get comfortable with his power and his authority. And so I think that there was certainly a easing in process. What was really interesting and one of the things that surprised me the most in my research is I fully expected for there to be this outcry over the cabinet. And I looked and looked and looked and looked, and there wasn't any objection to the institution. People seemed to have a sense that, of course, the president is going to need advice. There was objections to how certain people operated in that institution. So Americans started to criticize Hamilton when they feared that he had too much power and he had one foot in the executive branch and one foot in the legislative branch, so much so that they started comparing him to some of the most hated British prime ministers in British history. And so what this revealed to me is that they trusted Washington and they were willing to trust the institution as long as it was clear that Washington was in charge. But if they started to have concerns that other people maybe were in charge, that was when they started to voice those objections. Mm. That makes great sense. It really does. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the evolution um, through Washington's tenure and beyond. Um, you mentioned that the first meeting of the cabinet didn't take place until two and a half years in, uh, in September of 1791. And by the time we get to 1793, they had only had nine cabinet meetings, which is astounding 
you know, I think to the the outsider, to, you know, any observer today, you'd think, well, the cabinet probably meets on a regular basis. You know, when, when I was an executive at Ford, we had weekly meetings at the executive level all around the globe on Thursday morning at 7 a.m. You could count on it like clockwork. <laughs> and in some ways, this is how the modern uh, business meeting has evolved from a cabinet kind of meeting, you know, your, your board meetings, executive meetings, et cetera. But it was a very, very short cadence. So how did that how did that evolve over the rest of Washington's time in office, the, the remainder of his first term and into his second term? Washington was very intentional about using the cabinet however he thought would be most productive for him. So he convened meetings up to five times per week, sometimes for several hours per day in moments of crisis when he really needed the advice of multiple advisors and he needed multiple perspectives. They were trying to come to some sort of compromise or develop a new strategy. In particular, 1793 was the high point of cabinet activity. But he also was quick to avoid cabinet meetings, to prefer written or one-on-one correspondence with cabinet secretaries if he didn't think that they would go well or didn't particularly like the secretaries. So towards the (laughs) end of his presidency, he had another batch of secretaries that I affectionately call the B team. And (laughs) he, um, (laughs) and I call them that because they really just were not up to snuff with the first round and Washington was pretty explicit about it. And so he just didn't really meet with them. And it was clear that he was kind of avoiding them. And so What this left for his successors, however, was a really critical precedent, which is that the cabinet secretaries are not institutionalized as part of the executive decision-making process. They have the right to offer their opinion. They don't have the right to demand that it be taken or followed. And the president really gets to decide if they're in the room or not. And so – That was really a centralization or even like a foot stomp, if you will, of executive power. And that works really great for some presidents. Some presidents can take that flexibility and do remarkable things with it. Other presidents really struggle with it and their cabinet kind of runs over them. Yeah, and I think the the cabinet that is probably the most uh, legendary in that respect is Lincoln's. You know, of of course, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's famous A Team of Rivals where Lincoln assembled a remarkable cabinet of uh, people that he defeated on his way to the White House, people who could have been very embittered uh, to having been included, even if they felt that it was like a uh, just a, a kindly gesture. And yet Lincoln, another emotionally intelligent president, uh, really understood how to work these personalities and get the best out of them as he was seeking counsel. Yeah, what's I think remarkable about Lincoln is it was actually fairly common practice for presidents up to that point to bring their rivals into the cabinet. That was sort of standard fare, and it it didn't always produce great results. However, what Lincoln is what made Lincoln so unusual was that he of all of his rivals was the least well known and the least experienced. So he kind of had the mm. least claim to actually be president. Whereas, for example, <laughs> like <laughs> when James Madison uh, became president, he had a lot of his rivals in the cabinet too. But it was James Madison, and everyone right. kind of knew that he was going to be the next person. So I think the fact that Lincoln was able to take his you know, what should have been sort of subservient status and use his emotional intelligence, his humor, his incredible ability to manage men and create this very productive cabinet, it only adds to his political genius. 100%. 100%. So let's fast forward to the modern day and compare and contrast, shall we? There's been an interesting... um, Shall we call it roller coaster of cabinets over the last, oh, say, decade or so? Um, you want to talk a little bit about what we've seen, what we're seeing now, and perhaps uh, compare and contrast? Absolutely. So, some of the lesser appreciated precedents that Washington established that actually continue to govern sound like common sense, but are actually really important. So, first, presidents should really try and avoid scandals in their cabinet. That sounds like a duh statement. 
Well, come on. Then it what sounds... would cable news talk about? <laughs> what did Washington know about cable news? <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it sounds like such an obvious. Like it shouldn't even have to be said. But you know, scandals detract from a governing agenda, and they detract from the administration's attention, and they make it harder to get things done. So. Washington was very quick to snuff out any hint of scandal, even if it meant not speaking to people that he had been friends with for many decades. And most presidents, obviously, have really tried to follow that model because they want the American people and the American press and Congress to be focusing on what they want them to focus on. Obviously, the previous administration seemed sometimes to actually court scandal. The president would announce changes of staff and personnel on Twitter, often without telling them ahead of time or without a replacement lined up. So this is not standard practice and represented a departure from the status quo. Another really important precedent is trying to limit turnover because whenever you have to bring someone new in, it it takes a while for them to get up to speed. It takes a while for them to meet the rest of the staff. It takes a while for them to get a handle of all the issues, as well as a departure of that institutional knowledge. So it is going to slow down an administration whenever you have one person leave and another person come in. Um, President Obama, towards the end of his administration, actually had pretty good stability in terms of his cabinet. Uh, President Trump, in terms just in terms of the numbers, had more turnover in one year, one four-year term than any other president. And President Biden, while he is only a couple of years into his administration, thus far has not had any turnover, which has not happened in a very, 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 very long time. Yeah, that's astounding. That's astounding. And what's interesting, too, is when you look at uh, President Trump and his approach to cabinet, uh, it seemed very reminiscent of the way you described that uh, General Cornwallis surrounded himself with elites and yes men in the first chapter of your book. Um, and, and this almost goes against the grain of what we see with Washington's first cabinet. And it's, it's about hiring for skills, hiring for diversity, hiring for unity, uh, rather than just cronyism writ large. Absolutely. So the best cabinets, when we think of the presidents who have made the most of this institution, of course, Lincoln is up there. I would argue Jefferson actually had a remarkably effective cabinet himself. Uh, FDR made the most of his cabinet. I think Theodore Roosevelt had a pretty good cabinet, even though he really struggled to keep a secretary of the Navy because he couldn't help himself and kept meddling. But other than that, he had a really good cabinet. Um, these, these presidents we're not afraid to have someone tell them no. We're not afraid to have people who disagreed with them, who offered them complex advice that they didn't always want to hear. It made them better. It made their presidency better. And uh, it takes a strong leader to be able to hear opinions you don't want to. And so <clears throat> the presidents that have done the best are the ones who are willing to admit they don't know everything. Um, and that can be really hard for someone to do if you have the sort of ego that I think we all acknowledge presidents have to have, mm -hmm. but you have to know when to also check it at the door. Yeah, 100%. And I think that just the very classical Socratic debate that happens with these kinds of relationships is important. There's a give and take. There's a um, an acknowledgement that someone's bringing new information to you that can perhaps, you know, a U.S. president, that can perhaps color how you see things. And when we consider that in the last administration, um, the president's closest advisors seem to be television personalities. And that's really just feeding information rather than actually having any kind of debate. So I think the, the healthier cabinets, as you say, are the ones where there's a give and take. And ultimately, uh, they know it is the president's decision, but they're offering advice and counsel. That's right. And I think that I can't remember which president said this, but one of them said there are no easy decisions on the president's desk that by the time it has gotten to the president, it is a really difficult decision. And 
lives are often at stake. It often has implications for the global economy or the global community. And so when you're talking about the sheer complexity and number of difficult issues facing the president, you want there to be a lot of different ideas and eyeballs on those issues. Otherwise, you're going to succumb to things like groupthink or bad decision making. And it's pretty clear from, you know, CEOs and boards all the way down to nonprofits, that if you can pull together a diverse group of people, they're going to make better decisions. The same is true for the presidency and the cabinet just on a much bigger and I would argue more impactful scale. Yeah. So uh, bring it home for us. If you had to list out the top things that you know, leaders today can learn from George Washington's management of his cabinet, what would they be? So the first thing I think Washington would articulate is that each group of individuals requires a different management strategy. So one size does not fit all. And he was pretty attentive to trying to find the best way to work with different people. And yet, and this is sort of contradictory, but I think is complementary, the ultimate purpose of the advisory board was to help him make the best decision. So if they didn't really like cabinet meetings, that was less important to him than whether or not they were productive. So to keep sort of the big picture goal in mind. And then the last element, which I think we've talked about in different ways, is coming, but is recognizing the importance of diversity, not as a PR necessity or an HR box to check, but rather as an asset and uh, something that will supplement and better the knowledge and the decision-making process of the person who is ultimately in charge. And whatever, wherever the buck stops in any particular organization, they will be better off if they have different ideas and people around them. That is fantastic. And, of course, we are all uh, very much the, the wiser and the better for Washington having committed so much of this to writing. I mean, if he had left it all up to in-person meetings and conversations around his parlor or his study, uh, this would be lost to history. And uh, we're fortunate to have that and fortunate to have people like you, Lindsay Chervinsky, author of The Cabinet, George Washington, and the Creation of an American Institution. Thanks so much for being with us here on Timeless Leadership. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Chervinsky. The conversation continues for paid subscribers to the Timeless and Timely newsletter. Just go to TimelessTimely.com and punch that subscribe button as hard as you can. You'll be made a member of the Ampersand Guild, which gets additional essays, the off-the-clock bi-weekly Saturday essay, and more. Would love to have you as a member of the Ampersand Guild here as part of Timeless Leadership and Timeless and Timely. I'll be back here again next week with a little commentary. Answers to your questions, don't forget to email me at timelesspod at scottmonte.com and more. Our theme music is Americana Aspiring by Kevin McLeod. In the week ahead, I hope your actions inspire others to learn more, dream more, do more, and become more. The true hallmark of a timeless leader. I'm Scott Monty. Thanks, and I'll see you on the internet. <laughs>